Hi there. This is session nine of programming from the very basics using Python. In this particular short video, I will talk about using the ternary if expression. This was supposed to be covered in session eight, but we know that session eight spilled close to one hour. So I thought it's better I make them up as a separate video. So here it is. Um, we will learn how to use the ternary if expression and uh, also understand some example code with possible use case for them. First of all, I should tell you that this ternary expression or ternary if expression is also called as a conditional expression. When I say conditional expression, what does it mean? Well, it works based on a condition. The primary part of this expression is a Boolean expression. It takes a Boolean expression as one of its operands and based on the Boolean expression evaluating as true or false, it will evaluate two other expressions. Wow. There are three operands in it. That's why it's called as a ternary expression, right? So the syntax for this would be or like this. You will just say um, the true expression if condition else false expression. It's just a, like a pseudo code. I just typed the pseudo code. It's not really working Python program. You can see that condition seems to be highlighted. That's not what it means. Just read it like English. The main keyword here is if and else. You'll also know that this if else keyword is used in the compound statement, also called as condition statement. It's the same keyword being used as a part of an expression here. Now, how does it work? It takes three operands. The first operand is a true expression that will be evaluated if a given conditional expression is true, else it will evaluate the false expression. So it's basically this, you have an if else kind of a condition, right? You say, if it is raining, I want to stay back at home, else I want to go out and play. You see that if else being used. So if you want to formulate that as a ternary if expression, you'd say, uh, go out and play if it's not raining, else stay back at home. Or maybe stay back at home if it's raining, else go out and play. You see how I'm formulating the words. It's supposed to be read like that. Now, let me show you an example for this. I think there's a easiest example I can think of is an example code with use case, of course. Um, let's consider finding out a number and check whether a number is uh, even or odd. It's a very basic, classic uh, program exercise, right? I will show you how it can be done in just about one liner. I mean, actually two lines or maybe three lines, right? Because I'm going to make it more verbose. So I'm just going to type num is equal to int of input of enter a number. I'm going to get number from the user input. And I guess you understand uh, this part of the statement, the expression here. So there are multiple parentheses. So some of you who have slept off from my earlier videos and woken up now, you might wonder what's going on. Int of, input of, okay, it's pretty straightforward. Input is a built-in function that prompts for user input by printing the string. It prints a string and gives a prompt expecting input from the user. Whatever the user types, whatever we type, that would be returned as a string. But assuming that I'm expecting a number as in user input, and I want to convert to integer, integer number, let's assume. So I'm going to use the in constructor that reads in a string of digits and creates an integer out of it. And that integer object that's created is now being referred to by this label called num. Num will be basically representing a number that the user types. That's what this statement does. So this expects user input, and after that, I want to print a message odd or even <clears throat> based on what kind of number the user types. The user types are number like say 12. I want to print it as even number because 12 is an even number. But if the user types are 13, I want to print it as an odd number. So how do I do that? So it's pretty straightforward. All I need to do is just type new variable called result equals, I'm just going to type even if num percentage two equals zero. Now you might wonder what is this num percentage two equals zero? What do you mean by that? Uh, let me just 
create a cell below to show you what it does. Let's consider for a while that num is equal to 13. So this is the value of num. How do I verify whether the number is even or odd? You try dividing this number by 2 and check its remainder. If you divide this number by 2 and the remainder of division is 1, it's an odd number. You know, 13 divided by 2 will always give you a remainder 1, right? So if you just try this. If at all, if at all I try uh, a number like say 14, you can see the remainder is 0. So you can see that percentage is a modulus operator, also called as remainder of division. So it basically gives you the return value, which is the remainder of division. So you can actually check the remainder of division and verify whether it's equal to zero. So this will give you true if it's an even number and return false if it's an odd number. I guess you understand this expression. I just put this expression as one of the operands in here to this ternary if expression. Right? The first operand is the return value on true if this expression evaluates to true, else what is a false expression? That is, I'm going to just return on. I'm just going to print the result here. That's it. Three lines, as I told you. If I run this, as you know that if you use input function in VS Code, Visual Studio Code, your input prompt comes on top here. While this code seems to be ticking, you need to type in the input here. So you can just type the input as 10. Let's assume uh, 10 is the input. It prints even. If at all, I rerun this. I rerun this one more time. Control enter. If I type, let's say, 11, it prints odd. If I print, let's say, some big number like this. You know, the last digit is 4, so it's an even number. It says even, or if you try anything else, or that's it. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? So this is how you can use the ternary if expression to evaluate a Boolean expression that is passed as one of the operands. And if this Boolean expression results in true, the written value of this Boolean expression is true in the Boolean context, then it evaluates what you pass as first operand. If this evaluates to false, it will evaluate the second operand. Here, I've used values directly, which is like strings, right? But you can have another expression. Maybe you can do some arithmetic expression and written that also. So any valid expressions can be used for these ends. And this operator is not unique to Python. It is there with a slightly weird syntax in all variations or descendants of C programming language. Uh, in the C programming language, many of you who have done some C programming would know this as the question mark colon conditional. You know, in C language, you would do it like this. I mean, I'm just going to put the comments in here. Okay. In C, it's more like, uh, I don't think it's going to work like this, but I'm just going to show you the expression per se. It's like trying to print, uh, you know, I want to say maybe uh, one for even and zero for odd, let's assume. So I say one. Um, I, I, first, I need to use the condition and use a condition like this. Num percentage two equals zero. I put a question mark and you will return one or you will return or you will return zero. I know it looks a little weird, right? In C, in C language, C, C++, Java, all these languages which support this question mark colon conditional, you put the expression first, check whether the return value is true. If it's true, return this. If it's false, you return the other one, right? Uh, this might look a little unintuitive for new guys. So in Python, they have wired it up in this way. So if at all you want to Check for conditions as a part of an expression. You can use this idiom. Um, by the way, some people who learn a little bit more of Python will ask me, can I use it? You know, can I use multiple conditions? Can I use, let's say, elif condition? Oh, you can't do that. You cannot have multiple else if kind of scenarios here. But however, your condition checks can be more sophisticated. You could say num percentage two equal to zero, and you can also ensure and num is less than some other condition. Let's say num is less than 40. You can, you can check for multiple conditions by chain loading them with the Boolean logical operators, which I covered in the previous session. Uh, you can either use and or, or not. Not is to negate the condition, right? So all these can be done in this particular uh, scenario. So, but of course, this is not going to check whether the number is even or not, because obviously any number 
which is divisible by 2 is an even number. There's no condition check for minus, you know, less than 40. But I'm just giving an example. Uh, the other examples that I can think of similar to this would be, let's say you want to, uh, you know, um, send a message. Let's say to turn on the air condition or turn off the air condition based on the temperature settings, right? So I can actually do this. I can just say um, temperature equals int of input of enter temperature. This time instead of using int, let me use float here. So I can get floating point precision. Enter room temperature. And you can just provide message equals turn on if temperature is greater than 35 or maybe greater than 30. Else, they're not. And then I can use a print to say, you know, um, please, instead of calling it a message, let me name this more, uh, you know, apt and say status. Let's say, please. I know status doesn't read good. We have to think of a proper word for this variable. Let me know what's the right variable name that you should be using for this. Now, I'm just using some name here. Now when I run this, I can try maybe um, 25. Please turn off the air conditioner. If I try to run this this time and say maybe 32, the temperature in my room is more than 30 degrees, 32, let's say. It's all in Celsius. I'm using Celsius as a standard. Some of you might want to use Fahrenheit if you're coming from the US, right? In the place like US. So you there use Fahrenheit, but Europe, India, it's all Celsius here. But anyways, it doesn't matter. You can just change the number accordingly. You can say, please turn on the air conditioner here. So you can see how you can decide what to be performed or what message to be printed based on a condition. That is why this is called as a conditional expression, right? And you can see that this is used as the right hand side. Uh, some of you might write code that looks like this. Let's take this even odd example, right? Uh, it's very common for people to write code like this. When I, I do this pretty often. So if at all I want to print a message, let's say um, the number num is n. I can say maybe why the number, I think I can just directly say num. When I run it this time, let's try maybe 34. It prints a more intuitive message. It says 34 is an even number, right? You can see that. But if at all I rerun this and try maybe uh, 27, it prints 27 is an odd number. Now, some of you might try to over-optimize your code. Uh, this habit actually comes from mostly programmers who worked on scripting languages like Perl or Shell, right? I come from that kind of a background. I worked extensively on Perl and Shell in my initial days of my career. So after I started from assembly language, moved to C, from C, I went directly to Shell and Perl and PHP and then many other languages, right? So uh, when you come from that kind of background, we have the habit of cramming in a lot of code in fewer lines. You say, oh, number of lines is too large, say 100 lines, let's make it shorter. Let's make this code as short and tiny as possible, right? And uh, in order to achieve that, what you might want to do is you might can, you can actually put it like this. And you don't need this extra variable anymore. It's not a two-liner. So you can see that. I'm taking user input as a number. 
taking it as an integer and then I'm trending that number is an, so it prints whatever, whatever the number that user types, that's printed first, followed by a space, you know, print always adds a space after every argument being printed by default. So num space is an space, it would print even if the number is even, else it'll print odd in that place. So either, either, either even or odd followed by number. So as a result of this, you get this kind of an output, say 27, I'll, I'll run this again. Let's try maybe 25 this time. It shows 25 is an, you can see this time it figured out that this expression evaluated to false. So therefore it printed the word odd here, followed by number, right? This might look very short and tiny, but is this a good practice? I would be a little biased in my opinion here. So in Python, I would not recommend writing code like this. Don't try to aim for making a code as short as possible at the expense of readability. In my opinion, at a certain glance, when you try reading this code, it might look a little counterintuitive because you're hiding a lot of details in here, which looks counterintuitive. In my opinion, I would recommend not to use complex expressions as a part of print function. Simple expressions are perfectly okay. Simple addition, multiplication is perfectly okay. Using a complex expression like this, like ternary expression, might end up hurting readability. So as I always told you, you write programs that others can read and understand. You always think of the others, right, when you write your code. So you always say, oh, if I'm the person who's reading this code for the first time, does it look readable? Does it look good? So you think of that in mind. So um, I can just uh, go back to, I'll just, I'll just leave this code as an example. This does work. So I'm just gonna call this as avoid ramming lot of code in short spaces. Like, you know, avoid this. It's always better that you follow the code, which I showed you in the beginning. This looks good. I think maybe if I want to improvise that code, I can uh, just copy this code itself. And rather than having this as crammed in here, I could at least say result equals the good old B. And you know what the result, you know, when I, when I, when I keep writing code, I always think of beautifying it as much as possible. That's a thought process you should have. So I type result here. You know, reading it as num is an result number, mm, doesn't work, doesn't look very nice to me to read. So I would rather call this as even or odd. And just use even or odd. So even or odd is equal to even if num percentage two is equal to zero, else odd. How does it sound? It reads nice, isn't it? Print num is an even or odd number. So it looks pretty obvious when you look at this. Oh, this is either even or odd. And how is even or odd computed? That's how we see. So whenever you write any piece of code in Python, the code should be sort of self-documenting. You shouldn't be having to write comments to say what this code does. Let me remove this top comment, which is not the case for this one, right? So by looking at the code, it should look very obvious to any user, any programmer there is, like, you know, any other programmer who's going to read your code. They should be able to find out and say, oh, okay, uh, this looks intuitive. So naming variable the right way helps a lot. That's why I chose the word num to indicate short for number. Sometimes you can type number but it's okay to type num because num means number. It's a shorthand. Even or odd, some of you might say EOD. Oh, I don't know what EOD means. Is it end of data? I don't know. So try to use, um, you know, uh, names judiciously in a way that you should look at it yourself as a critic and think, how does it sound, right? I might be exaggerating all this, but this is all the habits you should inculcate when you start coding. 
right? If you're writing simple programs where you're trying to try out some small stuff, like all the previous sessions that I used me, you've seen me using variables like A, B, and C, uh, they don't do anything sub anything practical or anything sophisticated. So it's okay to you have one letter variables there. But the moment your code is going to be something useful, a useful utility, then it's always a good idea to use right naming conventions and right ways to name variables. So whenever you read it out, a well-written program, especially in Python, should read more like English. So I read it out, it's like even or odd equals even if num modulus 2 is equal to 0, else odd. So the num modulus 2 is like if number is even or odd, right? So we can actually shut on that anyways. And you can say print num is an even or odd number, it reads better. So use these kind of analogies. This will actually save a lot of time. Oftentimes some people also argue with me and ask me, tell me, tell me that, you know, you're typing too much over here. So it's a, you have to spend more time in figuring out uh, proper names and all that. Isn't that a waste of time? Well, the time you invest in making a code beautiful and elegant and easier to read goes a long way in saving more lot of time in maintaining that code. Maintaining that code, that's very, very important. Um, and you should also note that, um, you know, if you spend about, just this is the, uh, you know, I would say, um, like an urban legend or not, urban, not an urban legend, it's a very commonly used uh, quote in the internet, I would say. If you're gonna, if you're gonna have 10 minutes to write a program, Spend at least six minutes to seven minutes in beautifying your code. Of course, assuming that you know what you're doing. Of course, sometimes if you don't know what you're doing, you need to spend more time figuring out the algorithm and all that. But assuming you you got that all sorted out and you just want to type in the code, you spend six minutes in making sure the code is clean, indentation, punctuation, everything. And even the naming conventions are all clean. And the next four minutes, you'll test the code. You spend four minutes or maybe two minutes in writing the code. You'll spend the rest of the day debugging that code, <laughs> right? So I'm not making this up. This has been a reality. Uh, the code that keeps failing all the time and has trouble maintaining are code that's not well written. That's always the case. Yeah, that's most of the time that is, right? Sometimes you maybe some people would argue and say, no, the language that we chose is bad and all that. That's different. That's a uh, another practical aspect. But assuming that you're using a language like Python, you always emphasize on readability, right? And at the same time, I should also tell you, okay, now I wrote a cell here. Let me talk about some interesting things with Jupyter Notebook here. So this code looks nice. I want to store this in a separate .py file. I want to store this cell in a .py file. How do I do that? So for all, I want to save this code in a .py file, note down the cell number, uh, run this once, you know, there's no cell number associated. The cell number should show up here. If you're using the VS Code's version of Jupyter Notebook, so you see cell number 15, cell number 12, this does not have any number because I think I modify this code. The moment you modify, the cell number goes off. So you run this code once, determine the cell number, just like testing it and making sure it works. It worked. And now it's cell number 16. What do you do now? Create a new cell here, a new cell. Use this magic command. The magic command is percentage save. Any command that comes after a percentage sign in Jupyter Notebook or in IPython, these are IPython specific magic commands. These are not Python statements. These are not Python expressions. The save is a command understood by this tool called Jupyter Notebook, right? So it's a percentage save. And if you just pass on as, uh, let's say, even or odd dot p1, it'll save it in the current working directory. It'll save this cell. Which cell? Oh, it saved, uh, oh, it saved the previous cell anyways. Fantastic. That's nice. Actually, I suppose to say which cell. Oh, it saved everything. That's bad. <laughs> it saved. See, when I say percentage save and try to save it as even or odd or p1, it's, it's saving everything. Everything got saved. All the cells got saved. I don't want to save all the cells. So what I want to do is, if you want to save a specific cell, we know the cell number 16, you can actually say save even or odd dot py, and followed by that, you can specify which cell number you want to save. I want to save cell number 16. And then 
try running this. It's asking that even a rod.py exists, do you want to overwrite yes or no? I will just type y to indicate yes and press enter because previously I saved everything. It shows what got saved here. It shows that these three lines are going to be saved into the file. Now to verify that, you can open up your Anaconda prompt and test it. So I think I'm going to open my terminal instead. Yep. If you're, using, if you're a Windows user, whenever you see a terminal on my screen, which shows up shows up with the shell shell prompt. You know what is what's the deal? You just have to go to the start search and I mean the search, the search bar, new Windows task bar. Type Anaconda command prompt. You get that prompt. Once you get that prompt, you might have to change your directory, your current working directory, to the folder where you normally save your Python files. I think we set that environment up in second session. Go back and look up if you have forgotten. So I think we, I created a folder called Python samples. So I'm going to just say CD, PY, PH, tab, autocomplete. Tab will autocomplete the path in both shells, in Anaconda prompt on Windows or also on your Linux or Mac OS terminals, right? Whichever folder you created. So it's saved in this folder. You can see that because I launched Jupyter Notebook from this folder, you can see there's a file called evenarod.py. So to run this, you can just type Python, even or odd.py. It asks, enter a number. And now I can just type in a number here, 45. Enter a number, 12. Enter a number. Keeps working, right? So this is how you can save any interesting cells, which has a complete program. You wrote a complete program in a single cell. You want to save that cell into a .py file, note on the cell number, and in another free cell that is available, you can just use percentage save, whatever file you want to save it to, followed by the cell number that you want to save. And that will do the trick. And yes, with the time left, I want to tell you some more interesting things um, about good practices in writing programs, or if you're building a command line application. This might look like I'm jumping a little forward, but you know, uh, we are always, we are already nine sessions off. <laughs> Right? So it's time to get you up to speed on certain aspects. It's not going to be very difficult. One of the interesting things about Python is its libraries. There are a lot of libraries available in Python. Python is a high level language and the language aims to be more practical, which means that you don't have to build everything from scratch. There are libraries available for just about every anything in Python, just about anything. You want to build a web application, there's a library for that. You want to um, get to consume some APIs, there's, web, web, there's a web APIs, there's a library for that. You want to, let's say, communicate or interact with some large language models to query some AI bots to answer some queries, like you want to automate chat GPT, let's say. There's a library for that. So a library for just about everything, maybe graphics, game design, you name it. So there's a whole variety of libraries available for just about everything. There are some libraries which are bundled with your Python runtime, which is, we, which is what we know as the standard library. The standard library will provide some of the basic features, which are like common use cases. But let me tell you, it's well-equipped. The standard library is very well-equipped in Python. In fact, uh, today it may not be so relevant but back in the days when I was exploring Python in the late 90s and the very early 2000 era, right? I used to compare Python with Perl and TCL and those are the prime languages that time competing in the automation space, right? And uh, I used to dabble in all the other languages and I used to also look at Python. One thing that caught my attention about Python is that when you install the language, it gives you a fantastic help system, which we saw in the last session, help, the help function. Shows you all the topics, right? It has a well-equipped help system built into it. With Perl, you had to really install something called Perl docs and use some Unix commands like man and so on and to, or Perl doc tools to look up the documentations, like a separate tool chain. And it's an optional installation. And uh, another interesting thing is that the default set of libraries that comes bundled with the language is very, very vast. I would say it has almost a, uh, most common use cases for automation, um, 
you have more, all the standard all the features in standard library should be sufficient but as with Perl and TCL you need to go and install libraries separately all the time with Python you I rarely had to do that and that's one interesting um, thing I noted and to that end how are these libraries used almost all the libraries in Python are exposed as modules modules so Python is a modular programming language so it means your programs are just a bunch of modules of code with some definitions. Like code and definitions are packaged in a module. A very high level uh, analogy of a module would be something like a, a backpack that we all carry. I don't have a backpack in front of me right now to show you, but yeah, don't worry, I don't want to get off my seat. Uh, so if you carry a backpack, what is that backpack? It's like a package. It's like a it's like a package that you carry along with you. What does it contain? It depends on who you are and where you're traveling, right? A typical backpack of mine would contain uh, my laptop, let's assume, because I always like to code or do certain things, right? I want to be always connected. So I'd carry a laptop. There are some stationaries, some files and pens and paper, perhaps. And maybe I have a water bottle and some snacks and... Uh, some other stuff like that, maybe my phone and my charger and all that. So basically a backpack is a, a package of many objects inside it. You have a laptop, you have a phone, you have a phone charger, you might have your pen. All of these are different objects. They're not related to each other, but it's just that they are put together in one box or one package. A module is pretty much the same in Python. So if you have a bunch of functions, which are somewhat related. They are related functions. Like for example, you have functions to perform a lot of mathematics. Let's say, find out the square root of a number, find out power of a number, find out the sine, cost, and trigonometric calculations, right? Or you want to find log of a number. All these are mathematical functions. You can put them together in one package. And that's a module. We call that a math module. Math module. In order to access a module, the basic way to access a module is to import it. You can like import math like this. There's a module called math in Python, standard library. So when you say import math, this module is loaded. This module is made available for me to use it. Now, how do I use this module? You can access all the members of the module if you know what, is, what those members are. For example, if at all I want to find out sine of a number, I can say math dot sine of any number, let's 30, sine of 30, right? If at all I want to do a math.py, there's just a, a variable defined inside the math module and uh, you access it by math.py. I can see it shows 3.14. You can see the syntax I'm using here. The sine is a function, though it's written as sin, we pronounce as sine trigonometry right yeah and this function is inside this module it's like i have a stationary inside the backpack so if i want to get the stationary i should reach out into the backpack and to get the stationary right so that's what this math dot means when there is a dot here that's an operator it's also called as an attribute resolution operator what is dot dot is the attribute dot is the attribute resolution operator just like we have all these arithmetic operators like plus minus multiply divide they work for numbers you can use certain operators for strings perhaps and uh, similarly when you're dealing with modules you access the modules members with a dot operator so module name dot member the moment is import math the module is made available math is technically an identifier that identifies a module a module is also an object, by the way. A module object is created and math is going to be referring to it. And the dot operator is to access ingredient of that module. And what ingredient you want to access, what content you want to access, that name you should know. Right? But how do I figure out what are the contents of math module? One way to find out is this. Layer of The moment you type DIR, it shows you a list of 
elements which are part of the module. In fact, if you're using something like Jupyter Notebook, especially in VS Code, uh, the output will get truncated if there's way too much of output coming up. It shows the output is truncated, viewable as a scrollable element uh, or open a text editor. So click on this. Now we can scrollable element, you can scroll it. You can see there are so many mathematical functions and so-called constants defined like pi, e, all these are defined inside this here. Now there's another module called sys. For all I try to say, import sys. Sys module, sys is a short for system. What does this module represent? Everything that you want to know about your Python runtime, uh, all the features of Python runtime are available through this module. What kind of features? I want to know what version of Python I'm using. I can type sys.version. It prints a string. It shows I'm using Python 3.11.5 and all that. So it prints a string. If I want to find out, let's say, um, where do Python look up for modules? sys.par. When I try to load a module in Python, in my machine, Python will look up these locations for loading a module. Modules are also files stored somewhere. They're generally, most of the modules are files. So where does it look them up? It looks up in these locations. Yeah, modules are of different types. Uh, there are some modules which are actually stored as files, but modules like sys is not a file. I'll, we'll discuss that when I talk about a dedicated session on modularity and modules, right? But for now, I'm just giving you the basics. Why to talk about this is that once you know how to load a module, if you know what modules are available and you know what module provides what features, you can always use them to your needs. Now, why I, talk, why I talked about module as a detour is because let us say I'm going to write an application, command line oriented application like this, like this, Python even or not. You know, uh, it might look nice to interact with the user and ask for user input like this and then print it. But a good design for command line programs, programs that run in your terminal or your shell is avoid interaction. Look at all the, I'll not say all, majority of the programs that run on a Unix command line, a Linux command line, or a Mac OS command line. They rarely interact with you. They'll not ask you questions. They'll ask you questions only when there's absolutely necessary. So for all I type, like say, maybe, um, cp cp is a command on all unixes to copy a file type cp here it doesn't ask me enter the source file source path enter destination file it doesn't ask any questions it rather flags off an error it says missing file operand so most of the command line tools are designed to work based on arguments passed to them based on arguments passed to them if you're going to process arguments there are two ways to do it one way is using sys module, and when you use sys module, sys provides an element called argv, argument vector, argv, which will have a tokenized arguments passed to your program as a list, and you can read it. That's one way to use it. It's a very low-level mechanism. But there's a better way to process command line arguments and that is using a dedicated module in Python today. It's called as the arg parse module. Wow, session seven, session nine, session nine, and I'm talking about arg parse module. Oh, what's, what am I doing? <laughs> yes. I will be chunking in words here. Now and then. So this gives you some time to explore, explore out, learn things, and keep up pace, right? That's how it's going to be. But it's not like something that's super sophisticated. So it's like, when you're doing a learning, just this is a digression, sorry. Uh, when you're learning something, it's not like you need to have a pinpoint focus on just one path and you learn. When you do that, uh, you'll take a long time to learn sometimes. Sometimes you take care of branch out. You need to branch out. That's what I preferred and that worked very well for me. I hope it works for many people. You take this onion peel like scenario, layer by layer. So you learn a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this. Only as minimal as necessary. Then go one more layer up, learn more deeper into them, learn more deeper into them. And as you go along, you would be able to cover more ground, right? That's how we've been learning in schools, isn't it? So it's not like you spent, we spent about uh, two years learning just uh, mathematics and 
next two years learning just physics and next two years learning only chemistry. Now we don't do that. So in a typical school day, you have like, you know, uh, we have multiple periods, right? We have, we have a physics class, we have a chemistry class, we have a maths class, we have an English class, <laughs> right? And we keep progressing. And sometimes if you see at least an Indian syllabus, it's like this. You would learn about a basic structure of an atom maybe at one class. Maybe, I'm not sure. Maybe is it at 7th or 8th? Maybe it starts from around that time, around the grade. And slowly when you go two grades above, you'll learn the same subject again with a little more depth. Two grades, a little more depth. Same subject, a little more depth as you keep going layer by layer. This gives you a more exploratory view to your learning. Right, that's what I'm trying to achieve here. So I did, I do take some path where I talk about everything. I had to cover expressions. I do the basic things. I'm trying to cover taking a path. But after that, slowly you'll see me covering broader spectrum, right? So you want to be prepared for that. So I talk about art parts module here. And I will tell you how to learn new things. That's a very interesting one. Obviously, though, I'm going to have a multiple sessions going on in this video. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be like an encyclopedia. Definitely, definitely not possible. Not humanly possible. Just so think of Python itself. In terms of libraries that are available, it's like a vast ocean. And uh, I could only show how to swim one part. But once you learn swimming, you should be able to explore all the different parts, right? So that's exactly how you do learning. And uh, I'm going to show you how to learn new things. First, open up your web browser. I think it opened up the old page, I think the last session's page, you can ignore that. Um, if you go to python.org, I talked about the documentation here, Python documentation. And I told you that no matter where, what tutorials you read, what videos you watch, ultimately, I recommend you to read the tutorial completely. Complete the tutorial. And this will make sure that you understand most of the core features of Python syntax and Python language as such. But once you finish the tutorial, I also recommend you to read at your leisure the library reference. But the library reference is vast. So I told you, you could just read the built-in functions and the built-in types, which is good. So I talked a lot about numbers. I, I gave you some hint about data types. So you can see all these are covered in here. Look at numeric types, click on this. All the arithmetic operators I talked about. Maybe I skipped some of them, like say plus x and minus x, which is pretty obvious, so I skipped it. There are some functions which I didn't still get covered, like absolute value of a number. I will do compare, I will do cover them. Div mod, some interesting ones, but again, you can jump forward and learn these things and explore them, right? It gives you that opportunity. So you can learn a lot of stuff here. Just an example, right? I talked about numbers, you can see so much of depth is covered in the tutorial um, in the standard library, in this case. When you scroll a little more down, you see a lot of modules being listed here, a lot of modules. If you want to manage, let's say, time, your date time module, for example, basic date time types. There's also, it also, you see also module, calendar module, time module, zone info, date utils, there's so many modules available. So let's say I'm going to take time module, which is a very simplest uh, module. Uh, from here, you can just see time module provides all these features. It gives you a lot of functions. Uh, they tell you how to call it. They all might also give you an example on what could be the return value. For example, you can try this out. If you go to the Python, if you go to the Jupyter Notebook here, try to type import time and type time dot local time, for example. Gives you some output that looks like it. But if you type C time, gives you the current time date. I think this is the time when I'm recording this video, by the way. So it tells you what time it is. All these are documented in here. You can look at these docs, try it out, explore in your REPL and see and read this document and say what it says, what it does, right? And this is how you learn new things. Of course, you cannot just go step by step and learn every single module. No. When you need it, you search here and you figure out what module could be used for certain use cases. Arc parse, I told you. I'll show you what is arc parse here. It's a quite exhaustive module. I'm going to be covering two full sessions on it. Hopefully, I will do that. Covering all the intricate details about arc parse much, much later, right? Maybe after another 10 more sessions or 10 or 15 more sessions later, I'll be covering a lot of modules. I'll do cover individual modules here. 
RE module, R parse module, and struct module, and a couple of them, right, in the standard library. But for now, if we just search for R parse, just a first layer of it, it's a parser for command line option. So if you're going to be building any kind of command line oriented applications, this is a module that you will need, right? Uh, there are also alternative third-party libraries available. Some people ask me, what about opt parse? What about, uh, you know, there's so many different libraries available, right? But uh, this is there in the standard library, and this pretty much will suffice for most of your use cases. So it says how to use it also. You can just copy this code and try to figure your way out. So it tells you how to initialize your parse module, how to, add, <coughs> sorry, how to add an argument, and how to access it. I'm going to show you how that's done here the, for a very basic use case. So let's say I'm going to write a full-blown program just to check whether a number is even or odd. How am I going to do that? This program is not perfect because there are a lot yet to be covered, right? So that's the reason. I'm going to create a new file here. I could have opened that existing file. I think I'll do that. I go to this file explorer, click on this tab. It opens a file explorer. Assuming that I've opened this folder already, Python samples folder, that file even odd, odd is right here. I can click on this. It opens up in another tab. I'm not sure if I need this line. Let me remove this. Doesn't matter to me. So here I'm sorry. Um, here I'm just going to use uh, import arc bars. And then the way I use it, I can just say parser is equal to arc parse dot. There's a member called argument parser. Argument parser. This can take a lot of arguments, but for now I'm going to keep it as simplest as possible so I don't have to cover a lot of things in short tenure. So I can say parser is equal to arg parse dot argument parser. What does it do? This argument parser is a class, like a type, like int, float, also built-in types. But this is a type that is stored in a module. It's a new type in a module. What's the type? It's an argument parser. It's a class. You called it like a function. When you call a, call a class like a function, a new object is constructed of the class. This is a variable. This is an identifier that identifies the return value of this expression. And this expression returns an object, an argument parser object, right? The instance of argument parser. I can maybe run this independently and show it to you in a Jupyter notebook. I can show it to you right here. These two lines, I'm going to copy it here from here. When in doubt, you can always do this. Go to Jupyter notebook, create a new cell. And in this new cell, I'm going to paste this and print what parser is. Do you see that? So whenever you print this parser, it's like you're asking the string representation of this object. And his object says, I am an instance of argument parser where program name is ipy kernel launcher.py usage is equal to none, description is equal to none. It gives you some details which you can for now ignore. <laughs> okay, so this is just an instance of argument parser. In fact, when you do a type of it, you'll get a very clear understanding on what type it belongs to. Type of argument parser, what type is it? See? Arc parser, argument parser. The argument parser is like a separate type, just like int, float, and uh, complex, string, boolean, all these we have as built-in types. But this is not a built-in type, it's part of a module. Only when you load that module, you get access to that class that defines a type, and you can instantiate it. You can create an object of the type and use it. Now, having said that, once I create this parser object, this parser object allows you to add arguments. That's the beauty of it. This, this is like a framework which provides a seamless way to build a program that can process command line arguments. So here I could type parser dot add argument of the argument that you pass is a string. And the string I'm going to pass will be, let's say, a string, what do I call it? Number. number right and um, you can now say args is equal to parser dot parse args 
you can see that I'm using step-by-step -step code here, the step-by-step -step code, right? I asked Python to load a module, create an instance of an object based on one of the modules defined types. And in that object, I'm invoking a method. This is a method invocation. Oh, anyone ask me what is this parser dot? Parser is an parser is a representation of an object. When you use a dot, I'm referring to a member of an object. And remember, it's a method here. So the, to the parser, I want to add an argument. See, uh, methods are what? Actions that you can perform on an object. I think I talked about objects from earlier session. Objects are what? They are some kind of a data structure. There's kind of some kind of structure that represents some data or values. But not just that, they contain some attributes and methods or attributes in general. Uh, for example, if at all I show you the good old highlighter, I remember what this is now, <laughs> highlighter. This highlighter is an object. It has, certain, it has a lot of attributes. What are the attributes? Uh, the color of it. Uh, I'm not sure my screen is reproducing it in some color, but this looks like orange to me. Yeah, it is. Maybe whatever you want to call the colors. I call it orange. Okay. <laughs> it's not orange. It's maybe it's red. Maybe whatever. Bright red. And uh, that's a data attribute. It's got a shape. I'm not sure. If it's, not, it's not really cylindrical, but it's got this kind of a shape. And it's got a brand. Uh, it's Tedler. Right? Whatever. All these are the attributes. It also has a cap, and this cap can be opened. This is an action, open, open, right? This removes the cap off. I can close it back. So your actions, these actions are methods because I'm changing the state of this object. And now the marker is, this, this particular pen or this highlighter is open. The highlighter is closed. I can open it. I can write or highlight with this on a piece of paper. And I can close it. Open, highlight, close, or open, write, close. These are methods. And when you invoke these methods on this object, it changes the state of the object. The more you start using this by writing, the ink in this will obviously reduce, right? So that's what, that's what methods do. So an object is merely an embodiment of some data which represents state some data that represents the state or the attributes and methods that operate over them, methods that change the state or access the state and so on. That's what an object is. Take everything around us. If I have a, I have a remote control here. It is my air conditions remote control, right? Uh, my room air conditions remote control and uh, obviously it's an object. And this has a lot of buttons on it, the buttons. Pressing these buttons are like invoking methods. Uh, this remote control has got attributes like the color of the remote control and what kind of remote control it is. I have a lot of remote controls, not in my desk, it's there. But uh, yeah, there are many remote controls in my room. But if I take every remote control, each one is, got, is meant for different purposes. They represent their data attributes, let's say. The brand and whatever that is, right? And how many buttons are there? But the act of pressing these buttons invokes different methods. Like increasing temperature, reduce the temperature, power it off and all this. They change the state or through this remote control to that air condition, right? So that's what you see this. In fact, uh, some people will argue and say this is a design pattern, bridge pattern, doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, so don't, don't worry about that. But now, an object is more like an embodiment like this. It has states which can be altered using invocation of methods on them. Every single object works like that, right? So there's R parts. Module gives you argument parser class. I instantiate it and I get an object. To the object, I'm adding one feature. I'm trying to say add a new argument by name number. And then when I say parser or parse args, this will do all the magic of parsing command line arguments. You don't have to do it. It'll do it magically. It'll verify whether you're passing the right command line arguments. So in fact, uh, when I'm passing this, one more thing. When I add argument, I pass number here. I can pass number followed by, I can type help, I guess. Help is equal to, uh, input number that needs to be checked. I can add some input like this. Here also when I'm using argument parser, there's a keyword argument. Again, it's optional. It's not compulsory. I'm just adding it. I'll show you what it does. I say args is equal to parser.parseargs. And after that, I don't need this line. 
this line is not required. I'm going to just comment it out. Not a good thing. I'll delete it. Yeah. Some people have the habit of putting a hash before a line to disable that line from being executed. But don't follow that. That's not a very good habit. If you don't want a line, just remove it. But maybe you say, I want it back later. Create another version of the file. That is always better. <laughs> have one version with that line there. Create another version of the file without that line. That's always a good practice. Follow that. Uh, some people call this commenting the code, like turning this code off, right? You can put a hash before it. The one to put a hash before a line of code, that line will be ignored by the Python runtime. But when you do that as a habit, problem is that you'll end up writing clumsy code, the code that nobody can maintain. So don't use comments to disable code. Okay, don't do that. You probably want to disable code. Just create another version of this file, another copy of this file, with that line being removed. So you have one with the line there, one without the line there. That's always a cleaner way to manage things, right? And yes, if you want to maintain multiple files like this, that's where you need to learn how to use some kind of source code control. Git is a very popular tool for that. Uh, some people might also use Mercurial or Subversion and so on, but that's up to you, right? So use some kind of a version control mechanism. So that's what you should always practice. Now I use args is equal to parser dot parse args. This time, instead of checking directly over here, uh, uh, num is equal to, I can just use args dot number. Args dot number. There's another thing I need to do is that when I use add argument, whether I use a help or not is relevant, but very important thing is type. I expect the type of the input must be an integer. The type must be an integer. Type must be a number, right? Must be an integer. So just use type is equal to what argument type are you taking? Whatever the user types as a command line argument, you want to treat it as an integer, you say type is equal to int. You need to pass that as a configuration. It's like a method where you're invoking something on the parser object and trying to say parser, parse an argument whose argument will be represented as number, labeled as number. The type of it must be an integer. And for the user, just print this help. That's what this indicates. And now, with all this being said, here also wherever there's num, I can just change it to args dot num. Because I use this argument called number here, I can access this like an attribute of an object once I call parser dot parse args. All that magic is done by this parse args method, which we will go more one more layer deep much later and talk about arc pass module in depth. So for now, I'm making it a practice for you to start using this at the earliest, right? That's why, just note this down, okay? Note this down. In fact, I'll be sharing all this code in my GitHub link, which I'm sharing with my video description. So I have a look into that. So once I've done this, I can run this program now. Just one moment. Now when I type Python, even or odd dot py, do you see it throws a error here? Even or odd dot py, it says usage, even or odd dot py minus h number. Minus h is an option. It's like an option or it's a number. Then it says even or odd dot py error. The following arguments are required number. Even if you try even or odd, it, it, it expects you to pass an argument. So the argument is, to be passed here, like you see here. So I just type a number like say 45, but try four, but try 12, it works. As you can see here, this is considered a good practice. You might wonder what's wrong with uh, interacting with the user. Whenever you're writing a program in Python, uh, not only Python, you know, writing a program in command line, command line program, most command line programs are designed not with user friendliness in mind. User friendliness is just one part of it, but that's not the important criteria. Most command line oriented utilities are designed to be automatable. You should be able to automate it using another program. I can write another program which can execute this program and pass this argument if it is not interacting with the actual user. The program is interactive, then it's difficult to automate. 
You can, but it's a little difficult. You need to add extra effort to feed in the input, automate the standard input. But this is easy to automate. And that's one of the rationale behind a lot of command line utilities that you'll find on even your Windows command line these days and uh, mostly on the Unix world, like Linux and Mac OS. They're not very user friendly because they are programmer friendly or power user friendly. Power users are people who write scripts to automate tools, right? So when you're building a tool, you should think of that aspect. You should tool, your tool, if your tool is automatable, the chance of your tool being popular, used more widely by others is more likely. If it's not easily automatable, if it's very rigid, it expects a user to be there and explain to the user, enter a number and all that. It's not automatable, so it may not be used in a very wide manner, okay? So things to keep in mind. And the pattern I told you right now, whenever you want to parse arguments from a program, it's very easy to simply use arc parse module. The very bare bone usage I showed you right now with a lot of flexibility that arc parse module provides, which I'll slowly uncover as we go along. The very, very basics, import this module, create a parser object, this line, right? And then parser dot add underscore argument of what is the name of the argument you want to represent it as. And that name will be used as the attribute once you parse it. And then say what type that argument corresponds to, whether it's an integer or a float or a string, specify the type. If you don't specify a type, we'll assume it's a string. And then if at all, you can provide some kind of useful help that'll be printed if at all the user does not provide the type. For example, if at all I type um, Python even or odd dot py minus h, it's like help. It shows us, see this? Positional argument is number, input number that needs to be checked. This message, you see, it comes from this help. It's a framework that creates a lot of code to manage command line arguments. Doing it on your own, you can also do this whole thing on your own without using our pass module, but it'll, your code will become very complicated and not very scalable the longer. So I recommend using ArcPass module for parsing command line uh, programs, right? Parsing command line from a command line oriented application. All right, this was a little bit of detour. I know I just covered the ternary if, and that was a major part of this video where I talked about ternary if expression, but I thought I have up to one hour. So I'm just taking that leverage to cover some interesting things that you should, that I thought is worth noting, right? This allows you to write programs as I start giving you more exercises later on to practice, right? So, all right then. So I will I'll stop this video right here and um, I will meet you in the next one, the next uh, session. Hopefully I will be covering uh, the statements formally. So I'll talk about assignment statement as the next session. So we'll meet you on session 10. Thank you very much. And as usual, if you really like what I'm doing, if you like this video, um, do click on the like button click on the subscribe and also share to others, right? Share this uh, video link or the video to others. So I would see more people or be interested in it. Thank you very much. So meet you in the next one.